around the world. The Spirit is moving and a voice is being heard. Welcome to The Voice of Evangelism with David Langford. You can write to The Voice of Evangelism at P.O. Box 502, Kayser, North Carolina, 28020. We'll give you that address again at the close of today's broadcast. But here now is David Langford. Good evening, friends. Pastor David Langford here today. We'd like to welcome you to The Voice of Evangelism International Ministries. Today is Tuesday, February the 16th. 2021. Boy, as you get older, the weeks are like days, and uh, the days are like weeks as far as time. It just amazes me how quickly, swiftly it's going by. And as my grandmother always said to me, it'll only get faster as you get older. And I somehow think and believe she is right. Hard to believe I'll be 66 years of age Sunday. That's a long time, but as I get older, it's been a short time from just getting out of high school and now past the age of retirement. My, my, my. But we can't retire. We're working for the Lord. We've got to preach, keep preaching the gospel, the kingdom of God. We cannot cease in decreeing, declaring the word of the Most High God. I want to reread yesterday's scripture. This teaching series is entitled Preparing for the Darkness, but I want to reread our text. I don't usually do that, but I just sense such inspiration in the scripture text. I want to share it again with you today from John chapter 12, verses 35 and 36. Then, said, then Jesus said unto them, Yet a little while is the light with you. Walk while you have the light, lest darkness come upon you. For he that walketh in darkness knoweth not whither he goeth. While ye have light, believe in the light, that ye may be the children of light. These things spake Jesus and departed and did hide himself from them. While you have light, believe in the light. Believe in it that ye might be the children, the offspring of the light. I want to go back today for just a moment. I want to pick up on the word communion. We quoted 2 Corinthians 6, 14, Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? What communion hath light with darkness? What communion hath light with darkness? If you, as a blood-bought, born-again child of God, have been washed in the blood of the Lamb, you are forbid by the word of God, to have fellowship with darkness. We spoke yesterday from Genesis 1, verses 4 and 5, how God divided the light from the darkness. He called the light day, the darkness he called night. He divided them. God has never allowed darkness and light to have communion or cohabitate. They are always separated. Now, I said the word communion, the first portion of that word. It's a, it's a two-word, if you were doing English, C-O-M-M. And we use that as, as community and fellowshipping, being around people. But then we separate that from the word union, U-N-I-O-N, union. We are not to be in union with other believers, excuse me, unbelievers, We have to only have fellowship with true believers. Now, I suppose this is one of the reasons for so many denominations. Uh, Mainly, it evolves around the fact that somebody got a revelation and withdrew from those with whom they were associated with. We know that all the way back to... uh, 
the Catholic dispensation in the early church and, and, and how that uh, Martin Luther, his name was slipping my mind, Martin Luther had his 95 theses and he nailed it to the door of the church and he came out because he said he learned, he understood Romans 5 and 1, man is justified by faith. Not sacraments, not sprinkling, baptism, none of those things. He said this is all done by faith, by faith and faith alone. For by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. That's Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. The point is, Martin Luther got a revelation. And I suppose from that point onward, as men received insight, divine revelation from God, they would pull out of their existing denomination or those with whom they were in union with. We had the Union Army, and then we had the Confederate so you see the difference, the dichotomy. When we are truly walking in the light as he is in the light, we do not want to be in union with others or in union with false doctrine. You see that light pushes away the false doctrine. Now, let me say this. You can believe a wrong or false doctrine and be saved. I said you can believe in a wrong or false doctrine and be saved. I used to believe in the pre-trib rapture. I don't anymore. But I guarantee you I was saved. I don't believe that now. That doesn't mean because I've changed my belief, I'm now saved, or those who don't believe like I believe are not saved. These people are saved. They've just been taught something. They've rehearsed something so much. It's almost brainwashing to a degree, regrettably, and they don't want to talk about it. They don't want to discuss it. All they want to do is fight about it and argue about it. Hey, you believe pre-trip? God bless you. I just happened to go a little further in the word and couldn't make it work and understood it was a false doctrine. But the point is, we need to grow in grace and in knowledge. Now, I don't break fellowship over that. There are those who do. I promise you, because I'm a, a post-tribber, that's why 99% of ministries and churches don't want me because they just don't even like me because I am post-trib, you know. And uh, so it's just one of those things. But to say a person is not saved because they happen to have been taught wrong or believed wrong, you can't say that. You just can't say that. But if they walk in the light as he is in the light, they will ultimately come to the knowledge of the truth. Come to the knowledge of the truth. That is always possible to every man and every woman who desires to walk in the light as he is in the light. Now, we're not talking about sinners. We're not talking about people who are in flagrant sin. We're talking about people who say, oh, I'm a believer, but they don't believe like you do. See? We, 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 we know there are those who say, I'm a Christian, I'm a believer, I have faith in God. But they don't believe like we believe. And a fine example would be somebody like Pete Buttigieg. You remember the mayor who ran for president? Now he's on the some secretary or something for, I think, secretary of transportation or assistant secretary of transportation for Joe Biden. Now he says he's a Christian. He says he's got a man, he's a man of God. But he's a homosexual. And he has a man for a 
Well, I think he calls the man he's married to his husband, so that makes but a judge the wife, but he's a man. Too confusing for me. But I've often thought, if I had the mind of Pete Butter Judge, what does his world look like from a homosexual point of view? Now, regrettably, that is a very depraved, very skewed, and without a doubt troubled mind, the mind of a homosexual. Because there's no doubt they truly see things greatly, greatly different than we see them. I don't understand his point of view. I don't understand his world, but I assure you his world is a perverted world from the point of the view of the Word of God. God made them male and female. And so let everything produce after its own kind. Now, because more darkness is coming upon the earth, we're now LBGTQ. I think there's already another one. I'm not sure. I'm, I'm sure there is, but I don't remember the letter. Before long, they'll have the whole alphabet, 26 letters. Now, what? they don't want you to think is that there's something wrong with them. So they claim you have a phobia. You have a phobia. You have a mental disorder. That's why you have a phobia. They want to put the onus on you. But I'm telling you, sin is a perverted world. Sin is a perverted world. And you may be as straight and heterosexual as anyone possibly, but if you're living a life of sin and you're living in the sphere, in the realm of fornication, things of that nature, sin will take you further than you wanted to go. Sin will keep you longer than you wanted to stay. And sin will cost you more than you ever wanted to pay. You say, I don't believe that. I promise you, Anna Nicole Smith did not mean to overdose. Elvis Presley did not mean to overdose. Michael Jackson did not mean to overdose. Whitney Houston did not mean to overdose. But sin will always take you further than you wanted to go, and it will cost you more than you wanted to pay. None of them wanted to pay that way. But this is the problem. This is the circumstance and situation when you live in a dark world. When you live in that world of darkness, it is so dangerous. I'm going to teach this a little bit later on down in this series. But in the Exodus, when you read about the darkness... The darkness was so great, it says it can be felt. But when I was studying this out uh, some days ago, rereading it again, I read something that I had forgotten. And it says, And Moses stretched forth his hand toward heaven, and there was a thick darkness in all the land of Egypt three days. This is Exodus chapter 10. Verse 22, they saw not one another, neither rose any from his place for three days. And as I was reading that the other day, it jumped out at me. They were so paralyzed by the power of the darkness, the gravity of the darkness, the thickness of the darkness, neither rose any from his place for three days. You know why they were afraid to stand up, to move, or to do anything? It was just that dark. They couldn't see nothing. And that's what that means there. Neither rose any from his place.
for three days. They were afraid to physically even move. That's, that's, that's darkness. I believe, and we'll get into that weeks down the road. That kind of darkness, my friend, is the darkness of hell. But notice what it said first. But in all the dwellings of Israel, there was light. But when God sent the darkness, the darkness was so great. They were afraid to literally physically move. It was that dark. We're told in Ephesians 5.11, have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. Don't have no fellowship with them, but reprove them. Remember I said uh, yesterday uh, about the Holy Ghost being in churches, or last week I should say, the Holy Ghost being in our churches, how he will reprove men of sin. Who does that? The Holy Ghost. And we're told, have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. That's something that you don't hear preached, reproving or reproof or rebuke. You don't, you don't hear that today. These guys are a friendly secret church. How dare they reprove or rebuke anyone or have reproof? We don't want to be in the darkness. That's why we... As Christians uh, uh, are diswrought with our government, it's a government of darkness, deep darkness, thick darkness. You're troubled by it. I'm troubled by it. The only thing that can deliver that and set it free is the light of Jesus Christ, whether they believe that or not. You see, as Christians... And the very fact that we're washed in the blood of Jesus Christ, we are very unique because of our new nature. Till one becomes born again, they possess in their entirety the old nature. We call it the old man. Paul used the term in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. We are a new creature. We now have a new nature. That old nature's got to be gone. Now, it still lives there. It still abides there. you got to keep it buried. Buried. Brother George Alford, one of the greatest men of God I ever had the privilege of meeting, much less preaching for me. One Sunday morning, he stood there and he quoted the entire book of 1 Corinthians without opening his Bible. And I felt as though I was sitting there and Paul, the apostle, was speaking. He quoted the entire book of 1 Thessalonians, chapters, it has five chapters. 1 Thessalonians has five chapters. He stood there and he just quoted every, every verse, every word, every chapter. And it, 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 he, he had an ability uh, where to put the emphasis and to accent words. And it was as though the Apostle Paul was standing there. And he was, too, a man of little stature. And he wore a, a, a heel on his right shoe about three or four inches thick. I don't know if he—I never asked him. I assume it was polio or something of that nature. But just a, just a blessed man of God. And coming home one day, he said, David, let me talk to you, son. I was probably 31, 32. He said, don't ever let Adam out of the coffin. Keep him nailed shut. He said, if you ever let Adam out of the coffin, he said, he'll cause you more harm and more damage in one day than you can correct or fix in a lifetime. Never forgot that. Never forgot that. Why? Because Satan... If he can get you into your flesh, he will cause you more pain and sorrow and suffering 
than you can ameliorate, amend, or fix in a lifetime. And I think about all of these people I just named off a few moments ago who died, who died in an inebriated, drugged stupor or alcohol and went out to meet God that way. But when they met God, they weren't like that because that was their flesh. That was their flesh. Their spirit will not stand before God drunk. Their soul will not stand before God drunk. Their bodies what's drunk. So when they die, they stood before God in essence. Stone sober and probably wonder, what in the world am I doing here? You and I, though, are very unique. The Bible defines, the Bible describes our uniqueness as a Christian. You are very unique as a Christian. As a matter of fact, you are of another race. Oh, Lord, he's into racism, folks. Watch him. He's crazy. 1 Peter 2.9, ye are a chosen generation a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Remember that. First Peter 2, 9. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar People that you should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. That's what makes you so unique. He's, he's not talking about Jewish people here. He's not talking directly to Gentile people here. He's talking to his church, his body, the body of Christ. Now, the word generation here in the Greek means we are another race when you become born again. You become another race because you have been born again by the washing in the blood of the lamb of your garment. It's been washed, made white made clean. We are a new, we are a divine race because we are now a part of the church, the body of Christ. Now, I know some will say, well, that's crazy, that's cynical, but no, you are. When Paul is used, or Peter's using the terminology a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people. He's defining the church. Israel was a peculiar people. God gave them all these commandments, and you did this and this and this. You didn't eat this. You didn't commingle wool and cotton. There was just so much that God did. So they were peculiar. They were meant to be a holy nation, but we all know that did not work out so well. But because we are in Christ, we are not only a new race, but Peter says we are a royal priesthood. Now, the word royal there in the Greek means you are of a kingly disposition because you've been born again. You've been born again. Again, the world, excuse me, the word royal means kingly. You have a kingly disposition now because you are in Christ. You're born again. And then we read in Revelation 1, 6, and hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. The two words here, royal, priesthood, kingly, priesthood. Under the Old Testament, the king could not be the prince, priest, and the priest couldn't be the king. That's what God got up so upset with 
Saul was the king. He made sacrifice, which was Samuel's responsibility, or Eli. But he tried to do both, king and priesthood, and God rent the kingdom from him. Isn't it amazing the harshness as God dealt with anybody that tried to be king and priest? But now God says to you and I that are redeemed, a royal priesthood, meaning a kingly priesthood. You're a king and a priest. And, of course, he says there in Revelation 1, 6, and hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. You mean to tell me the washing of the blood of the Lamb atoning for the sins of mankind, we can be made kings and priests? That's what the Bible says. That's not false doctrine. That's the word of the Lord. I said that is the word of the Lord. That is as clear as it gets. It's as clear as it gets. But why can we now be made kings and priests? Because we are a royal priesthood. We are a holy nation, a peculiar people, the church, the body of Christ. It is so unique The very phrase, holy nation, again, that's what he wanted Israel to be, but Israel failed. Hebrews 3, 12, but with whom was he grieved 40 years? Was it not with them who had sinned, whose carcasses fell in the wilderness? They sinned. They failed in being a holy nation. But with whom was he grieved 40 years? Was it not with them who had sinned, whose carcasses fell in the wilderness? They failed in being a holy nation. We're told in Hebrews 3, 12, Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. When you depart from God, you lose that stature of being a holy people, a holy nation, a, a royal priesthood. We are a holy nation and that speaks directly to the church. It is, it is something like has never been before. Israel was a nation of people, a chosen people, an elected people. God made a covenant with a man called Abraham who left his dad, Terah, who was an idol maker. Abraham left all that, heard the voice of God, and God said, leave your family and everything and follow me. I'll tell you where to go. Now, as a holy nation, by the blood of the Lamb, now both Jews and Gentiles can be a part of that, and they can be a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people. They can be a chosen generation. Again, the word generation meaning race. You become a chosen race. Now, I'm not going to get out here in left field, but the church, the body of Christ, is, a, is truly a supernatural race of beings. You say, well, that's pretty far out there. I understand that. <laughs> How well do I understand that? But think about what I'm about to say. We don't see that in its fullness now. We don't, we don't see that yet. But when we die and go to the grave and when Jesus Christ returns and resurrects the dead in Christ, you will see that supernatural human race of people. Then they will be seen because we're going to get a body just like the body of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then the world, the carnal people, fleshly people, are going to see a race a race of superhuman beings that are immortal and incorruptible. You say, that sounds so far out there. Reread it, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. This mortal, 
must put on immortality. This corruptible must put on corruption. Can you imagine the right to say, I'm immortal? I'm immortal. Well, that's crazy. A supernatural human race, that's right. You'll be known as you were known. Jesus was like he was before he died, except now he had a glorified body. Super human race, chosen generation, chosen race, royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people. You, you, you think that's not being different? Peculiar? Absolutely phenomenal. So this holy nation of people, as I said, is the church, the body of Christ, and the church must keep itself pure. How, how do I keep myself pure? By bathing my mind, my spirit, my soul in the Word of God. Ephesians 5 and 26, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. You see, the word of God is like water. It'll wash your soul and your spirit and keep you clean. What do you think David meant in Psalms 119 verse 11? Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. You see, if you've got God's word in your heart and temptation arises, a verse may come out of your heart and say, thus saith the Lord, don't do that. Because Jesus said the Holy Spirit will bring all things to your remembrance. Now, there are things I remember out of the Bible. I don't have them memorized, but by the quickening of the Holy Spirit, I remember them. I don't have them memorized. There's, there's verses I have forgotten. I have forgotten. And then I'll be rereading my Bible. I'll say, well, I know that verse. I hadn't used it in a long time. But the God, through the Holy Spirit, can quicken your mind and bring that word that he wants you to have at that particular time. Now, one of the greatest things that God is going to do through his church, the body of Christ, He's going to reconcile the Jews and the Gentiles and bring them back together. If you are if you are not an Israelite, then you are emphatically a Gentile. I'm not going to get into the jewelry and all of those things. But God is going to do something that only he can do. And take those who were born under the law, just like Christ. That's, that's all they knew. That's all they were taught. And then, of course, Jesus came. They rejected him. They're still in darkness. Romans eleven twenty five. 25, blindness in part has happened unto Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. So they're going to remain blind until God does what he's going to do in finishing with the Gentiles. I believe the Gentile dispensation is waning to some degree. You say, well, how can that be? Well, in 67, Israel got the other side, the other half of Jerusalem. Under the Trump administration, the U.S. Embassy was moved from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem, recognizing that as the eternal capital of Israel. So it looks in, 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 in those manners as though the time of the Gentiles is winding up. This is the, the prophecy of Christ in uh, Luke 21. Luke 21, 24 they shall fall by the edge of the sword and shall be led away captive into all nations, and Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. 
filled. Those were the words of Jesus Christ. Paul says it almost identically. Then Romans eleven twenty five, 25, blindness in part is happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. So there's your fullness till the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. God is going to uniquely join us together. It's a spiritual union. It is a spiritual union. It will be spiritual communion. Communion. Ephesians 2.15, having abolished in his flesh the enmity or the hostilities. Anytime you read the word enmity, it's, 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 it's a word that defines being hostile toward God. Having abolished in his flesh. Jesus abolished that hostility by coming a man and dying on the cross. He put it out. He put out the hostility between you and I and him, or let's say the Father. Jesus was the mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. He was the go-between. He was the mediator. So here in Ephesians 2.15, having abolished, done away with it, just like an abolitionist, having abolished in his flesh the enmity or the hostilities Even the law of commandments contained in the ordinances, all of the law was being done away with. For to make in himself, to make in himself of twain, that is the body of Jesus, one new man, you could say one new nation, peculiar people, royal priesthood, one new man, so making peace. He's the great peacemaker. And that he might reconcile both unto God in one body, not two, one, Jews and Gentiles put together, both unto God in one body by the cross. You have no idea the gravity, the magnitude of that phrase, by the cross cross, having slain the hostilities thereby, having slain the enmity thereby. But it says, reconcile both unto God, both Jews and Gentiles, unto God in one body by the cross. That is so clear, only the cross and the shedding of the blood of the Lamb can there be found redemption both for the Jew and for the Gentile? There's some hooligans out there who says Jews don't have to be saved by the cross. Well, they're a hooligan and they're a jackleg. All Jew and Gentile can only be reconciled into one body by the cross. This is why we have so much false doctrine. It ain't anything but the cross. And Christ says he's going to take both Jew and Gentile and make in himself through two or twain one new man. And you still want to say the church is the bride. It just says right there, one new man, not one new woman, not one new bride, one new man. Now, I'm going to say this because I hear it a lot. Bride, 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 get the bride ready, get the bride ready, get the bride ready. It's not about the bride, folks. It's about the bridegroom. Read Matthew 22. Read Matthew 25. You ever see the word bride in that? No, you're not going to see it. It's not about the bride. It's about the bridegroom. John said, hey, the bridegroom's here. Is Jesus a man? Or was he a woman? The church is the body of Christ. Oh, great mystery. 
Paul says here in Ephesians 2, 15, one new man so making peace and that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, by the cross, folks, by the cross. Salvation is in nothing else. What a beautiful capability through what he did on the cross. Forget the forgiveness of sins, healing provided in the atonement, promised the Holy Ghost. He had to die before we could get the Holy Ghost, folks. If people only knew and read and studied their Bibles like they should. They wouldn't, they wouldn't be so illiterate. Jesus does all of this. But he did it through the work on the cross, even reconciling both Jews and Gentiles. One new man and one body by the cross. The body is the body of Christ. That's why you have to you have to really grasp it is only the shed blood on the cross that redeems. Redemption can be found in nothing, nothing, nothing else. Reconciliation can be found in nothing, nothing else. How do the great number in Revelation chapter 7, verse 14, this great number, John said, who are these? Or the angel said, who are these? And John said, thou knowest. These are they which came out of great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in what? The blood of the Lamb. Hallelujah. My God, I feel the Holy Ghost. In the blood of the Lamb. I am saved. I am redeemed. I am cleansed. I am forgiven by the blood of Jesus Christ. Oh, what power. Wondrous working power in the blood of the Lamb. The great song that Andre Crouch wrote, the blood will never, ever, ever lose its power. The power is in the blood and in nothing else. The blood. The cross. These life coach teachers aren't going to help you. They're going to hinder you. They're going to impede you. They'll ultimately damn your soul. You really believe that? I believe that with all of my heart. I believe that. I believe that. Because they are hirelings, million-dollar books, million-dollar jets, million-dollar edifices, begging for millions every month. And I shared with you, I think, two weeks ago where we're in one Hundred countries. People are listening to the voice of evangelism. One hundred countries. You are doing that. You are the impetus behind our ability to go. You're 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 the one that's the impetus and the power and the effort behind that. I'm I'm just the little uh, delivery boy, putting the newspaper in the mailbox. That's all I do. I'm nothing. Never have been, never will be. Don't want to be anything. By God, to whom much is given, much is required. All I want to know is, like Paul, Jesus Christ and him crucified. That's all Paul wanted to know. You imagine that, that vast knowledge that that man had, having studied under the feet of Gamaliel. All I want to know is Jesus Christ and him crucified. And know, him in the, and know him in the power of the resurrection. My Lord, the power of the resurrection, that I might know him. And I suffered the loss of all things and do count them but dung. Well, now, Brother Langford, I, I cannot consider the statue and position that I possess to count all things but dung that I might know this man you call Jesus. If you ever get to know him, you'll say all things are worthless and fruitless, and I don't need them. I just need more of Jesus. I'm not going to rehash uh, the programs I did several weeks ago, but we don't need a president. We need a move of God. 
I said, we don't need a president. We need a move of God. If you're looking to the White House for a Holy Ghost revival in your house, you're looking in the wrong direction. I said, you're looking in the wrong direction. Let me tell you where you look. Psalms 121, verse 1, I will lift up mine eyes unto the hills from which cometh my help. My help cometh from the Lord, which made heaven and earth. I don't need to look at the White House. I don't need to look what preacher they got up there that week, that month, that year. I just look to Jesus. I just look to the one who paid the price. I look to the one who is the Redeemer. I look to the one who is the Savior. I look to him because he atoned for my sin, and I owe him all of my life. like the blind man in the temple that Jesus healed. The Pharisees said, tell us again who did this. Ah, This man called Jesus. He touched my eyes. Actually, he made clay of the spittle and put it on my eyes and told me to go to the pool of Siloam and wash. I washed and I came forward. I can see now. They, They made that man rehearse that numerous times. And they finally said, that man you're talking about that healed you, he's a sinner. He's just an old rank sinner. And the man that was blind said, whether he be a sinner or no, I know not. But one thing I do know, whereas I was blind, but now I see. You can castigate him. You can call him what you want to. You can run him down like you want to, but let me tell you, I was blind, he touched my eyes, and now I can see. And everybody that's ever been washed in the precious blood of the Lamb, you, my friend, can now see. Don't put your faith in any type of your personal works. If you think what you did saved you, I'm going to tell you now, You're probably not saved. You're probably not born again. I'm not here to offend you. I'm not here to criticize. But I want you to understand this religion that we oftentimes encounter in our purported walk with God, this religion is dangerous. Dangerous. Religion. Religion is man's way. Don't you get that? Religion is man's way. God's way is the cross. Nothing else. You mean nothing else? Nothing, absolutely nothing else. If anything else had is uh, the size of a grain of salt to do with your salvation, then what he did on the cross was not enough. If, if your works are the size of a grain of salt and you say, because I did this, I, I'm saved, what he did on the cross was worthless. That is, you know, I'm beginning to believe, I'm, I'm serious, and my time is all but gone, I'm beginning to believe that is a revelation. Do what? The more I say that, the more I preach that, the more I teach that through the years, I'm really beginning to believe when you understand it is the cross that redeemed, the cross that saved, the cross that forgave of sin, when you finally come to that knowledge, that's a revelation. And when you understand nothing else has anything to do with salvation, it is a revelation. Well, I paid my tithes. That's what the Pharisees said. I fast twice a week. That's what the Pharisees said. I attend church. That's what the Pharisees said. I got baptized. That's what the Pharisees said. That's what they said within themselves. I've done this, and I've done that, and I've gone here, and I've gone there. And you know what is tragic? They prefaced that statement by saying that the Pharisees said, I thank God I'm not like other men, meaning I'm self-righteous. I'm not like other men. I want to be like Jesus and not other men or that or this. Walking and talking with Jesus, like 
Anthony Berger and Ivan Parker and Kirk Talley saying earlier in the program, this glory road, I'm on this road, and I'm going to stay on it until I inherit eternal life in Christ my Lord, whether on this side or the other side. It doesn't matter. But I want to tell you, your faith, your faith must be done, must be placed alone in what Jesus done on the cross that he might reconcile unto himself in one body by the cross. Read that again today, Ephesians 2, 15. Read it, memorize it. Get that in your mind, in your heart, in your spirit. We were reconciled both unto God in one body, his body, Christ's body, by the cross. Man, that's powerful. No, don't go buy one and hang it around your neck. You have to die daily and nail yourself to that cross. But Jesus paid the price for all of the blessings, for all of redemption, for all of the hope. He paid for it when he hung on the cross. And he reconciled both Jew and Gentile unto God in one body, by the cross. Whose body? His body. One new man. Not one new woman. One new man. I'm glad I'm attached to his body. I may be nothing more than a hair and an eyelash. But hey, I'm attached to the body. I'm attached to the body. You may be a little old hair on the eyebrow, but you're attached to the body. You're attached to his body. And in his body is life because he is that light. In him was life, and the life was the light of men, John 1, 4. We'll pick this back up next week. Hope you're being blessed. We've got a whole lot we want to share. I believe it will be very informative for you in the coming days. God bless you. The Voice of Evangelism with David Langford is brought to you by the faithful listeners and supporters throughout America. If you're looking for an uncompromising message, we invite you to tune in each week to The Voice of Evangelism. For more information, write to The Voice of Evangelism at P.O. Box 502, Kayser, North Carolina, 28020. That's P.O. Box 502, Kayser, North Carolina, 28020.